Hi, welcome to True Creeps, where the stories are true and the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore to the possibly plausible paranormal to horrifying history to tense and terrible true crime and everything else that goes bump in the night. We're your hosts, Amanda and I'm Lindsay, and we want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to talk about John List. And we mentioned him in our Watcher episode that we would be discussing kind of another case that went along with the Watcher. But before we get into John List, we're actually going to talk about the differences between what actually happened and the Netflix show. Just as a note, there are spoilers ahead. So if you haven't watched the show, you may want to skip to the John List part. We've listed the start time of that section in the show notes. In the Netflix show, there are only two children, both of which appear to me to be older than the kids that were actually living there. One of them is a a teenage girl who I don't understand a lot of what happens. In the show, there's a security firm, but it's not a neighbor. Rather, it's like a young kid who has his own security firm. Mm -hmm. And he ends up dating the daughter. And so like he's like in his late teens or like 20s and she's in her like mid-teens. So it's problematic. But in the show, it is him who has the online screen name, The Watcher. And he's like, oh, I only made that because I thought it was a cool name after you had told me about it. It's not me. And it also doesn't seem like it would be him, honestly, in the show. There's like this very bizarre racist storyline where the daughter basically goes online and tells everyone that her father has a problem with her dating the security firm kid because he's black when it's actually because he's an adult and his daughter is a child and it's just a really weird fucking tangent to take it definitely is yeah also the realtor in it is jennifer coolidge who i love in all versions and throughout the show she is sketch as fuck and she ends up with the house at the end the last name in the show isn't bradis it's bronick in the show The PI confesses that she was the one who wrote the letters because she was mad that she couldn't get the house. And she was the offer that pulled out due to medical problems because she was actually dying. And it turns out to be a lie. She just said it because she wanted to give the father some peace because he was relentless in his search. We talked about the theory that perhaps it was a high school creative writing assignment. So one of the storylines in the show where they talk about like who the watcher is, is that there's a teacher in the neighborhood who has an assignment where kids write to the houses. And they kind of like talk about that lots of houses in that area received letters over the year, not just the Broadduses. So it creates like an army of watchers, not just this one. So that is very interesting. In the show, the Brennick family actually lives in the house, but we know that wasn't actually the case. And we talked about this a second ago with the teacher and with the realtor, but the show really clearly references internet theories. And so when Netflix wanted to buy their story, they were like, okay, because at least we can negotiate some things in it. And they asked that the family not look like theirs. And they were like, can the house get burned down at the end? And on a sad note, They sold their story to Netflix and they still haven't covered their family's expenses from the mortgage and all of the private investigators and everything. Isn't that wild? So now that we've talked about some of the differences, let's talk about the John List case. I had never heard of this case until I was like looking at like the the Watcher research. Yeah, same, same. I thought it was like a fully fictionalized portion of the show. That's what I thought too, because... I don't know if you've ever looked it up. Well, I mean, we have for shows, but in general, when you watch a movie that's like based on a real story, a lot of the time, especially when it's like either horror or kind of true crimey, a lot of the things that they got from the actual story is the very basic things, like maybe the names or where they lived or whatever. But the crazy, gruesome or the scariest parts are normally made up. And so when you're watching The Watcher, you're like, that's kind of like an interesting part of the show. Yes. And that is based off of this person. So in the show, the character's name is John Graff. Yeah. Yeah. It's obviously not John List for reasons that we'll get into. So one of the most interesting ones that I had read about after, you know, a horror movie came out was The Conjuring. Mm -hmm. And again, I haven't read the book that one of the family members wrote, 
But in one of the interviews, I guess one of the family members said everything in The Conjuring that was kind of over the top where you would think, oh, that's what Hollywood added to it. They're like, that's kind of what happened. And like the more minute stuff is the silly things that were added. Oh, shit. But I haven't read the book. I want to. But I also heard that the book's kind of boring. And then I heard a lot about the Warrens and how they might have been frauds. So then I kind of got like, mm, I don't know. Yeah. Well, who was John List or in the show, John Graff? So John met his wife, Helen, in 1950 when he was stationed at Fort Eustis in Virginia. Helen was a widow of an infantry officer that had died during the Korean War. She had a daughter from that marriage named Brenda. Helen and John got married in 1951, and their first child together was named Patricia, and she was born in 1955. Their son was born in 1956, and their son's name was John. And then their second son was born in 1958, and his name was Frederick. Brenda moved out of their home in 1960 when she got married. John, Helen, and their children, as well as John's mother, Alma Barbara Florence List, moved into a home at 431 Hillside Avenue in 1965. John had just gotten a job as the VP and comptroller for a bank in Jersey City. He was also a Lutheran Sunday school teacher, so he had a lot to do. The home they bought was so big, it had a fucking name. Don't you wish that you could just, like, have a home with a, a name? What are you talking about? This is a Charlotte Villa. My parents' house is uh, Shanklin Manor, and my brother's house is Shanklin Estates. Does it have a plaque? Oh, no, no, it needs a plaque. <laughs> When I bought our house, because you've seen the top, right? Remember how I was screaming about it when you were here? Yes. It has an Alamo. It looks like the Alamo, and I hate it. I hate the outside of it so much. Anyways, their fucking name for their house was Breeze Knoll. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. That's a weird name for a house. It sounds like a golf course. <laughs> it does sound like a golf course. I mean, it could have been. It had 19 rooms. I know. Who needs that many rooms? I mean, I'm sure I could figure it out. You're going you're gonna to need two Roombas for that. Before this, we were talking about Roombas because my Roomba is just like throwing itself violently at the door while we're trying to record. <laughs> and I somehow have two Roombas and like they're not real Roombas, they're off-brand Roombas. You can have one upstairs and one downstairs for you. Yeah, that would make sense. So this house, by the way, too, was a Victorian mansion, which I want one so badly. I have like alerts on my phone for when Victorian mansions go up for sale. In a lot of different states, various states, because um, I need one. I love this. I just want a haunted Victorian mansion. Like, is that too much to ask in life? I don't think so. No. No, it's not too much to ask. So as an additional note, the family really wasn't social with their neighbors, which, I mean, fair. So let's talk a little bit about what happened. On November 9th of 1971, Liz murdered his mother, his wife, and his three children at Breeze Knoll. That's so sad devastating he shot each of his family members using a gun and he had two of them one was a semi-automatic handgun and the other was a revolver while their children were at school helen was drinking coffee at their kitchen table when Liz came up behind her and shot her in the back of the head later john would say i approached all of them from behind so they wouldn't realize to the last minute what i was going to do to them oh fuck this guy mm -hmm. chills I know. So his mother, Alma, had an apartment up in the attic. And so he went up there and she was eating breakfast and he gave her a kiss and then he shot her above her left eye. Gruesome. Mm -hmm. Next, Liz dragged Helen's body into the ballroom because they had a ballroom. Of course they did. And started cleaning up the kitchen. And he started cleaning up at that point because he didn't want the kids to know what had happened when they got home. Because I don't think he wanted them to be scared. He just wanted it to happen. Ugh, that's so sad. Yeah, I, it's still fucking terrible. So in between what he just did and what he will do, he stopped the mail, milk, and newspaper deliveries so that they wouldn't pile up at the home when no one came to get them from outside. He called or sent letters to Frederick, Patricia, and John's schools and jobs to let them know that the kids would be away for a few weeks and he had t given the reason that the kids were visiting Helen's sick mother in North Carolina. And she actually was sick. And but for her illness, she would have actually been visiting the lists. Interesting. And you know what? It gives me kind of Valo vibes when she took JJ out of school. Mm hmm. Yes. 
So List later told law enforcement that he had also planned to murder his mother-in-law. After that, he sat down on his kitchen table and had lunch, which is the place where he shot his wife. Oh, gosh. Right? And he said, I was hungry. That's just the way it was. And when he said that, he had a, like kind of a laugh to it. Monster. Yeah. So Patricia and Frederick came home from school and List also shot them in the back of the head. He then went to John Jr.'s school, watched him play a soccer game, brought him home. And then from what I see, I see two different like descriptions of what happened. One is that he shot him on the way home. And the other is that he brought him into the house and then shot him. But all accounts that I've seen show that there are multiple shots with John because he was trying to defend himself. Just so, so sad. Aww. So then what Liz did is he put each body into a sleeping bag. He left his mother's body in the attic. Then he dragged the rest of the bodies and put them in the ballroom. List also cleaned up the scenes where he had murdered Helen, Alma, Frederick, and Patricia, removed his face from all the family photographs, turned on a religious radio station, and then wrote a five-page letter to their pastor. The letter was found on List's desk, which was in his study. He said that he had killed his family to save their souls because he had seen too much evil in the world. He also referenced his money problems in the letter. Neighbors began to notice that the lights in the house were always on, and they didn't see anyone coming or going from the home. As the light bulbs in the house began to burn out more and more, neighbors began to call the police. So let's talk about the investigation. When the police did come, they got into the home by climbing in a window that led to the basement that List had left unlocked. Once inside the home, law enforcement heard, first, organ music, and then they came upon the bodies. Alma's remains were flown to Michigan to be buried, while the rest of the family was buried in Westfield. Dozens of police and FBI agents searched for List in the U.S. and in other countries. The house burned down in August of 1972, and while the fire was ruled arson, there was never a rest, and there were never any suspects. Which is very suspicious. Yeah. A new house was built on the property in 1974. The nationwide manhunt that began for List was pretty difficult because they had very few photographs of him. And part of the reason for that, again, was because he cut himself out of all the photos. So some existed, but there just wasn't many. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, there wasn't a lot of recent ones. So List's car was found at an airport in New York City, JFK, but they couldn't find evidence that he had boarded a flight. Later, law enforcement would find out that List traveled to Michigan by train. He then went to Colorado and began living in Denver in 1972. He worked as a hotel line cook, then took a job as an accountant. He began living under the name Robert Peter Clark and would go by Bob. He said that the name was inspired by a classmate of his, but the real Bob Clark would later say he didn't know List. Even though they went to the same school, he was like, I didn't know him. From 1979 to 1986, List was a comptroller at a box manufacturing company in Colorado. However, in 1985, he remarried to a woman he met at church, and her name was Dolores Miller, and she was an Army PX clerk. In 1988, Dolores and List moved to Virginia, where he worked again as an accountant at a firm. And then at the request of Union County prosecutors, America's Most Wanted included John List in an episode they ran in May of 1989. And then in that episode, there was a clay bust that was sculpted by a forensic artist named Frank Bender, and the clay bust was then age progressed. Approximately 22 million people tuned in for that episode, which is a crazy amount. List and his wife, Dolores, watched the end of the episode. So List later said, I was perspiring like anything, but his wife didn't see the resemblance. Terrifying. Terrifying, yeah. A woman who lived in Virginia called because the bust resembled her neighbor. Can I just tell you, if I was watching America's Most Wanted and they were saying somebody who was plus or minus five years of bed, my like true actual husband, his age, I would be like looking at the screen, looking at him, looking at the screen, looking at him, just making sure. Wouldn't you? Aren't you making? I mean, you know, Mike, since you guys were like way younger, but wouldn't you be doing the same thing if they were like, this guy did something in his teens and it was before you had met him? You have to act like you don't know, though, because then he'd kill you. Oh, that is true. You should be like, wow, what a nice commercial. Hmm, not you. Definitely not you for that's for fucking sure. I wonder who that could be. Not you. Or 
this looks like someone I ran into at the grocery store years ago or something, but like never, never that. Not you, my darling. I need to not be here. I need to go to a friend's house now. Goodbye. So other sources say that a neighbor from when he lived in Denver recognized him. So either way, someone recognized him. Law enforcement went to Liss's home where they spoke to Dolores. Liss was then arrested outside of his account firm where he was working in June of 1989. He was then extradited to Union County, New Jersey, but wouldn't confess to actually being List. List eventually did confess his true identity, but that was in February of 1990 because they matched his fingerprints to his military records and evidence at the crime scene. So they're like, okay, dude, like, this is you. Here's proof. Clearly. Let's go to the trial. Liss testified during the trial that he had been laid off from his job at the bank and he didn't tell his family. He would then get dressed every day and acted like he was heading off to work, but he was actually just spending time doing job interviews or reading the newspaper at the Westfield train station. I also saw that he took naps there, as one does at the train station. I mean, sure. Why not? List was siphoning money from his mother's bank account to pay the mortgage and some other bills. He had stolen about 200000 from her. How does someone not know $200,000 is missing, right? He may have been handling her finances, though, especially because, like, she lived in his attic, so she probably didn't have a lot of expenses that she was paying for. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Years ago, I worked at a company, and we dealt with large amounts of money with businesses, Mm -hmm. and it was a very frequent call that we would get that a business would lose lots and lots of money. And then figure out that they were missing it, like, years later. I don't understand how that happens. No idea. I was always very perplexed, alarmed, terrified, shocked. Alarmed. Yeah, that's a good one. So he also told his kids he wanted them to get jobs so that they could learn fiscal responsibility. But it was actually because he needed help coming up with money for bills. He, in part, wanted to save his family from the shame of losing their home. And it was when he knew the home would be foreclosed on that he decided that he was going to murder them, which there's so many different things to do other than murdering your family. Agreed. So during his trial, List was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, by the court appointed psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist testified that List saw only two options, either one, kill his family or two, accept welfare. And with the way that he was raised, it seemed as though accepting welfare would basically make him feel like a failure. So like anything to not have to do that. So the prosecution also hired a psychiatrist and they were like, he's having a midlife crisis. That is all this is. One of the psychiatrists said that Liz showed, quote, no evidence of anything that approached genuine remorse. He's a cold, cold man. Yikes. In April of 1990, Liss was convicted of five counts of first-degree murder. Thank goodness. During the sentencing phase of his trial, Liss begged the judge to be lenient because of his mental state when he committed the murders. He said, I feel that because of my mental state at the time, I was unaccountable for what happened. I ask all affected by this for their forgiveness, understanding, and prayer. Liss was sentenced to the maximum penalty five terms of life imprisonment. The judge said, after 18 years, five months, and 22 days, it is now time for the voices of Helen, Alma, Patricia, Frederick, and John F. Liss to rise from the grave. And all of Liss' attempts at appeals were unsuccessful. Mm, Good. So in 2002, Connie Chung interviewed Liss and asked him why he took the lives of his family rather than his own. And he said he thought that suicide would have kept him from heaven. I feel like this should also keep you from heaven. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He fully believed that he would be reunited with his family in heaven. He said, quote, I feel when we get to heaven, we won't worry about these earthly things. They'll either have forgiven me or won't realize, you know, what happened. You get fucked. Oh, this like also reminds me of Velo. Yes. So much. So, List eventually died of pneumonia complications in March of 2008, when he was 82 years old. So, this bitch got to live, you know, the majority of his life just moving around the country. That blows my mind. So, List died in 2008, many years before the Broadus is bought, 657 Boulevard. And so, I think it's just interesting that they use that story because he had already died. Yeah, they were probably like, what interesting things happened in the city? This is interesting. 
I feel like somebody Googled murders in Westfield and they were like, this happened. Done and done. I mean, fair. Like they they combined two stories. And and so what they had in the show technically wasn't anything of what happened in relation to that home. But like his story was still pretty accurate. He was the one making the sandwich in the kitchen, too. Right. Oh, yeah. I forgot that in the actual show, like the father comes down into the kitchen and there's this guy just like making a sandwich in his fucking house. And the guy's like, thanks. Yeah. So, like, it's an interesting uh, thing that they weaved into that show, even though they don't have anything to do with each other. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. This was a short little bite-sized piece this time around. The Watcher episode was longer, so this is our little, like, oh, and another thing. Yeah. And with that, have a great weekend. Thanks for creeping with us. Thanks for listening. And as always, a special thank you to our patrons who support us via Patreon. Please see the link in our show notes to learn more about how you, yes you, can begin to haunt the dump, guard vortexes, or even become a scorching Sasquatch. Ooh. Also in our show notes, you can find the link to our website, more information on our sources, our social media handles, and our merch store. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps and or ghosts. I beg of you. <laughs>"Look, could I've done to you. Mike would fucking have the Roomba going. It's like, Meh. it's like at the door hitting. <laughs> Let me in, mother. He's like, look, I can help clean the house. Also, he broke our Roomba like six times last week trying to change its rollers. He loves the Roomba so much because he thinks it actually does a lot. It doesn't. And so he bought like a kit to change its rollers and stuff. And then it just like broke down and said it was on a cliff. We bought one, like, an off-brand one, and my mom was like, do you want this thing? And I was like, okay, so now we have two, and we have not used either of them. Make them dual. Oh, who can do it better? Prove yourselves. <laughs> All I think of is DJ Roomba. Perfect. Oh, absolutely. Ab as you should. Every time. That's all I want. I was like, Mike, can we please find an iPod somewhere? Like, it has to be the same. It can't be different. I have an iPod shuffle. Can you tape it to your Roomba? <laughs> if I had them functional, baby. Maybe that's something else we can work on when we're there. Perfect. <laughs> Earn your keep. I stayed in one Victorian mansion. We went to Kansas last year and we got to Airbnb one and it was super creepy and I was in love. It had a lot of cow art, though. I prefer less cow art. That's like part of the farmhouse aesthetic is like an unnatural obsession with cows. Emo cows, though. <gasps> I know exactly what you're talking about. I knew the exact photo you're talking about. <laughs> Everyone does. It has like the bangs. <laughs> it's black and white too. <laughs> yeah. It's like up at an angle. Like it's a completely like it is so fully a cow scene MySpace photo because they're all black and white. Yes. The contrast is super heavy. It's up at an angle. The bangs are straight. Yes. Yes. That. I love how we're uh, talking about, you know, John and then we've gotten to emo cows and the segue was Roombas somehow you never know what you're gonna get <laughs> sorry I took a bite and I had taco in my mouth not the first time I said that but don't <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the end please <laughs> now she's gonna choke I just I have to change my tone because I'm about to say something very sad and I can't be laughing when I say it. So, gosh, I'm hitting my microphone stand. So let's talk a little bit about, let's talk, oh my God, Lindsay. Rumbas? Yes. I cannot find it. Do you remember what he was talking about? Do you even have it to give her? I can get this lickety split. Vans, hardware, Georgia, Guidestones. So it goes from like, Georgia Guidestones, what about... What's his website's name? Vanshardware.com. It's V-A-N-S, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder if he knows how often we think about him. I hope he knows. We should write him. Ran. Strange creature spotted in Arkansas. You bet your bippy. Oh man, you are fast. When did he write that? I told you. He wrote that in, well, it was 827 on whatever day it was. Oh, okay. Why would I ask you that if it has no... There's four responses. Let's see when they're from. Uh, I think it's from at at 
earliest it's 2013. Okay, and it was what it was Arkansas, right? Anything in Arkansas? My goodness. Okay, okay. Yes. <gasps> Hell yeah! I fucking told you, Amanda. Hold on one second. I'm gonna read this, and then I'm gonna tell you what Van himself commented back to someone. It was about the size of a small house cat or skunk, but it was broad, almost square from above, with the corners of the square providing locomotion at about the speed of a slow human stroll. The animal was no more than six inches high and had no obvious head or tail. It was covered in black or dark brown fur, which appeared to be short and dense. There were no markings. In other words, it appeared to be a black, furry, walking square. My wife, Kathy, said it reminded her of a monstrous four-legged caterpillar. And someone commented and said, Groundhog commented and said, it was me. And Van said, if you didn't have a tail, an identifiable head, and you were black, then you'd match what we saw pretty closely. My children refer to the animal as a pillow pet since it resembled the toy slash pillow. I said that so many times. Hold on. Can we just talk about his avatar real quick? It is, um squiggly square that is peach colored with big red lips and the antenna and a spring body and a spring legs x size it's like dead oh that's oh it is x size it is dead okay hang fire said badger oh my god i'm zooming in i zoomed in as much as i could you know what i'm really sad about is that the forum is closed now okay there's another comment i need you to read so there's also a comment from a person named Harvey who said that they were driving late at night and they were about 15 miles before Pine Bluff and they saw a strange creature come running in front of their car and they said it was like its body was like low to the ground and it was like 32 inches, which is a very particular measurement, to four feet long. How many 12-year-old boys would that be? I think it depends on how tall the 12-year-old boys are. Maybe one? Maybe one 12-year-old boy? One 12 year old boy long, but it had five feet and legs. Like, it had five legs, which sounds like it would be difficult to maneuver. Like, the odd number. How much do you think it weighed in men? Like, 0.3, like 30% of a man. One 12 year old boy long, a 30% of a man. In weight. One human, 30.3 human man is the correct measurement. Thank you. It had what they called fast run power and it had no tail and its skin was either a light gray or a light blue i think i'm <laughs> and they said it it looked like it was running a hundred miles per hour but they know only cheetah is 75 miles per hour yeah <laughs> no i loved it okay but if you're wondering what the fuck we're talking about it's from our georgia guidestones episode forever ago something going on it's van yeah van's hardware journal just has it's a weird website i don't condone it it's just bizarre it's like cryptids but also like conspiracy theory and like baseless claims some of it is like the news your misinformed relative gets from facebook like it's like that kind of vibe sometimes uh what a time what a time it's definitely something 